This is Gavin Rossdale on my podcast. We're talking David Bowie. And I hope I don't say something stupid to make me look dumb. Tell the rest of the band, Bush, I fucking love them. Gavin Rossdale and Josh are the newest best friends in the whole damn world. Do you love me, Mr. Gavin? Do you love me? Because I'm trying to impress you. How's that? You're a very you're a very attractive man, but it's not love yet, but I do like you. Dude, can I ask you a question? You what 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 is it like being honest to God, one of the most beautiful men in the fucking world for I, definitely out of the grunge scene. Definitely 100 percent out of the grunge scene. I put you up against anybody. What is, what is that like? Um, uh, thank you. Thank You're welcome. You. I, I'm thrilled to be in Adelaide. No, I'm, <laughs> um, I'm thrilled to be in Adelaide. <laughs> no, um, it's, we, it's, uh, it's, um, is that a Chaz guest picture up on your wall? Do is I have the guy on the, is it who made that? So painting? in the back, so in the back there, that's my friend Taylor did a, that's a picture of, that's, uh, that's Miles Davis. <laughs> Miles that's Davis my, said every musician should be a cook. He said yeah. every musician should be a cook. Yeah, he was a, like, I, we, we, you know, I love food and, um, and uh, I always, I always say that about Miles Davis. I hope you said it because I've definitely said he said it a number of times. <laughs> well, I have a, I have an Otis yeah, Redding I have an Otis Reddy paying in and the in other fact, room. Uh, my, sweet, my friend who I th there's a there's a wonderful artist friend of mine, Chaz Guest, and he, he just had a show with Vito Vito Schnabel in New York actually. And we're we're nice. friends, and um, I told him this one phrase. Actually, yeah, brilliant because he said Bowie. Uh, I said that Tom Waits. This one thing I stand by, like the way you do anything is the way you do everything. Yeah. Right. And I firmly believe that. You know what I mean? And uh, I told it to him. He loved it quote so much. And the other day I looked at his story. It, it, he, he, he copied me in on his story, like tagged me. And he's got, you know, uh, how have you, uh, the way you do anything is the way you do everything. And then it true to David Bowie. And I was like, really? And then put my name on it. Like, yeah, he, 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 he included me on his mistake. I like, and I wrote it back as like, that's so cool, dude. But I think Tom Waits said it. Bowie may have said it. You know, he was he was well known for like, you know, he had the sort of magpie quality, you know. But yeah. um, but uh, anyway, so, you know, so that, was that it... combines Bowie, Jazz Best, and Miles Davis all in one uh, response. I which, kind of peak. which you've just mentioned, two of the coolest musicians that well, actually three of them that might have ever lived: Miles Davis, Tom Waits, and and David Bowie. Uh, and being, and I want to get to the Easter eggs of how Bowie has influenced Bush and your music and your life. I, well, wait. David, tell me, yeah, go on, sorry. Okay, no, 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 no problem. Just, just Bowie bought me some coffee. No, right on. So, uh, so can we take that from this? I'll just say the whole thing again. So being that you just mentioned, in my opinion, three of the coolest musicians that have ever lived, Tom Waits, David Bowie, and uh, Miles Davis. Miles Davis. Um, since we're specifically talking about Bowie, for, the first thing is this, because I, I want to get to the Easter eggs that I've, that I've found in some of your music that is influenced by Bowie. Did you grow up in a musical household? Like, what was your musical childhood experience like? Well, um... You know, like my parents, when they were together, they, they, they broke up when I was uh, 12. Um, I lived with my dad after that. But um, they, you know, they had, it was a typical kind of small house, regular people. She had like, my mom had like Roberta Flack, one record of hers, Queen, and um, Carol King tapestry, you know, it wasn't nice. that many records. It wasn't a big thing, but what was incredible was that two things. One, I lived my house, 
the closest shop to my house up the street was um, a record store. Nice. So it's very much like that Malcolm Gladwell, that 10,000 hours thing. On the, but the Malcolm Gladwell thing, like you surround yourself, you know, it's only that proximity to music that kind of allowed me to spend all my pocket money on records. And my aunt lived with us when yeah. I was young. And she was amazing fun. Out all night, coming in, you know, she had a, a just was like a real wild spirit. And she lived at our house because she was too wild to have a regular life. And she gave me the uh, uh, the man who felt uh, the Bowie, the um, Ziggy Stardust, Life and Times of Ziggy okay. Stardust. And that changed my life because where I grew up it was kind of pretty rough. And everyone was into like, uh, you know, um, they would wear like, I don't know if you know what Farrah slacks are, Gabichi tops. They're like poor people trying to, they would dress rich. They're yeah. poor people. Rich. I still Farrah, wear that. Right? Football, football, football hooligans, you know, like ASBOs. Yeah. Anti-social behavior order kids, right? So everyone loved, it's so weird I'm doing this thing, this podcast, because for instance, a big song there was Patrice Russian when we were growing up. She had the song, Send Me, Forget Me Not. So it used to be this like disco song. And I, I was on that. a phone call the other day I was on a phone call the other day because uh, I was using his phone doing press and Patrice Russian sent him a text. <laughs> He's a tour manager for a bunch of people. And Patrice Russian yeah. sent him a text. I was like, oh my God, Patrice Russian. I knew her when I was like eight years old. She was so cool, you know. Send yeah. me, forget me. And, um, but I didn't really like that music so much. I would like, so I've always been like a bit of an art jock because I grew up playing football and you know, hanging out on the streets, all my friends and all that kind of nonsense that you do sitting around the States and stuff. And, uh, but I would always like, had my secret Bowie world because they thought that obviously that was not, you know, it was, it was a bit, bit more bit more taboo and they didn't really want sort of any feminine-esque outlandish figures. You know, anyone like, you know, if, you, if I said the word amazing, I'd get slapped around the head. You know, for being wow. too fancy. Yeah, you just get to be like really like play it dumb, low key. I just yeah. So I always and when we used to go to all the dances and all that, you know, I loved um all the goth girls, the punk girls. I was like I was a young punk, you know. I was into punk music and uh but just loved all uh, playing football and, and and playing tennis. But but I love so I've always been an art jock. I'm into that, I'm into painting, food, yeah. art, music, and I love sport. You know, I, love, I like it both. So, so that was a big, aunt, so Bowie, Bowie, yeah, began, right. Bowie began, Bowie was the stepping stone into everything because, you know, I could afford uh, singles each week and I have all those punk classics, I to all the punk records, all the Sex Pistols, Clash, Revillos, X-Ray Specs, Buzzcocks, Jam, everyone like yeah. that. I used to love that all those uh, records, but up the road where I go in there, they would be trying to school me and be like, "Check out the doors. This is uh, so and so. This is Bread. This is fucking Carol King. This is the Beach Boys. This is whoever." Yeah. So it was really, you know, like an education, a free education from strangers who ran the record store, and uh, I'm always grateful for that. And it's weird because I didn't really make music. You know, I didn't. I was too. I didn't think I would ever be able to make music. I just sort of loved it. And then when I left school, I was like, fuck, which way's the job that way? What else is there? What else, is, what else can I do? What else can I do? I can't do what I want. So I, I just know. began to write songs. And I was talking last night with my guitar player about it over dinner. Uh, Chris, I was saying like, like, it's so mental because I had no ability, no knowledge, no training, no nothing, just sort of, would do anything to avoid a standard regular job or go, I didn't go to college, you know, I just, what could I do? And I remember being so arrogant with my dad and be like, recording into a tape, we had like tape recorders then, it's like yeah. sing a song, right? It must've been like maybe on two notes, some terrible piece of drivel. And then I had a couple of guys who I knew from a school be like, you know, put some chords to that. We sort of had this, we had this, my first band. And um, it was such a brilliant, like youthful arrogance because I just forced my way into it. And you know, that's why with me, it's a weird journey because I'm sort of always getting better and always learning because I didn't really come at it like a, you know, a virtuoso kid trained, sit in my room for like 10 years until I was unleashed on the world. Yeah. I sort of was, just kind of grew up 
trying to get it done, you know, in front of a and men and in front of people. And it's an interesting story, but it's a very uh, flying by the seat of your pants kind of life. You know, it's not, I wouldn't recommend it to any of my kids. And I've got loads of kids. I'd be like, do not do it like that. Right. That's the worst idea. <laughs> so but so once you got that bug inside you that you were like dude i don't want a regular job i don't want it because i was me and my dad the exact same thing like every day my dad would would read the paper in the morning have his breakfast and then he put the paper down and do this sigh of just like <sighs> knowing that he had to go out into the world to do this job that he didn't want to do but had to support the family when you watch that much like you being like i don't want to have a regular factory job like i want to fucking do something um and then and for me it was comedy and music and obviously for you it was music and the arts and so on so so would you say that moment really after the record store is kind of schooling you and now you're you, you've been introduced to ziggy stardust like was that's the turning point where it's like this is something i want to do this is something i have to do oh no 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 it wasn't for a few years yet it was like okay. three or four years because all I did is I got lost in it. All it was was a refuge. And so when people, and I, you know, I'm lucky and I see people every day, wherever I go, wherever I go. I was in a bar yesterday. And I, I went to, it was like really hot here. We've got here and, and uh, I always walk around, check out the neighborhood. And I love to go walk and, and check where I'm at, you know? Yeah. So I end up in this bar as like one, one barman and like, some loser at the other end of the bar, you know, and me, yeah. three three losers in a bar at like 1 p.m. on a hot day, <laughs> having a cold asahi. And I was just intrigued, you know, about the guy, he started talking about Axl Rose or some bullshit. So I was thinking, I like to test people, you know, if they knew about that, I want to test the promo. How how many people is this uh, festival reaching, you know what I mean, that we're on? So I was like, hey, have you heard, what have you heard about Under the Southern Stars? He goes, ah, not too much about that, mate. Yeah, I said, uh, Oh, right. Um, cool, because I heard it's on three days here. I guess I heard something about a festival like that. I said, yeah, I heard some great bands. You know, I was fucking with him. You know what I mean? And he goes, um, yeah, uh, yeah, no, I haven't heard too much about it. I heard a bit about it, but I don't know. Yeah, yeah, not Guns N' Roses, is it? I was like, no, nah, that's some other, but it's an STP. <sighs> uh, he goes, what are you doing here? You, you, you go to see the festival. I said, I'm working at it. And uh, he goes, oh, cool, cool. What, what's your band? You know, and I was like, oh, I'm in this band. I'm in the band Bush. And so the, the guy at the end of the bar goes, pipes up. He goes, oh, I remember them. And I, like I said, this comes to work. So anyway, it was a bit of a laugh. But um, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, uh, um, it's been a bit of, it's, it's, it's been fun to be back on tour because I like all those interactions with strangers and with people. Yeah. I don't really get no oh my god that's like talking to people after show is some of the most entertaining shit in the world um look you're confused is you you your bowels are getting... yeah. uh yeah so that and what i was saying was that um you know with music it, it's like this refuge for people right and people mm -hmm. get lost in it and that's what i did for the first few years in a way is even almost better way around or not, I don't know, I, there was no other way around. But I got lost in music for a lot longer before I was ready to think I could even make it. You know? So I never, I never was like, I didn't uh, dissect it. I dissected it later. Then when I began playing guitar, then I would learn all those Bowie songs because they're really good for busking. You know, especially the Ziggy Stardust, they work, work well on those lovely chords and stuff like that. And so, um, but no, I, was, I got lost in music and then I began to make it later on. And, uh, and then it became my life work, you know, my life's yeah. work. So for Bowie, like, I mean, I'm going through like, you know, 16 Stone. I mean, obviously in everything Zen, you, you, you take a Bowie lyric. How influential was Bowie and has he been on your career? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's funny, it's funny that because um, that came out, you know, when I was doing Bush, uh, in, in London, it was like the, the worst commercial idea you could ever have. That was the height of Britpop. Everything was going on with Blur, Oasis, yeah. Suede, um, all those kind of bands, Pulp. And we were just like, we were just trying to be the Pixies. I mean, I was trying to be the Pixies. Just was thought they were the most exciting band. I loved that whole 4AD label. I liked throwing music, the Cocteau Twins, but the Pixies, 
it was such a brown sound. I don't know if you remember that record, Sir for Rosa, but it had the most beautiful cover, had the flamenco girl on there, it's a gold record, gold cover. And I just couldn't believe this band was just so, they were doing rock music that wasn't poison, wasn't like hair rock. Yeah. You know I mean, so it went from, I like Sex Pistols, Public Image, uh, The The, you know, those are the bands I really liked, Talking Heads, and, and it's a sort of like anti-establishment, but not, not sort of, not glam, glam yeah. rock, you know, which some people like. I mean, fuck me, Motley Crue, who are the kings of that, and I love Tommy uh, Lee, and uh, uh, he's a friend of mine. I mean, they're now playing stadiums, so people love all that, that stuff, you know, people love that. But I liked the fact that the Pixies were more concerned with hummus. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the singer from um, 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 from uh, what you call it, uh, Suede, uh, Brett, and um, and um, they, he interviewed him, and he was going to he was going to him. How come you're so good? So I was listening to Suede. I couldn't understand the music that much, but everyone was saying that the greatest band, and it was I was just being a, just jealous. So I was just so, I was just like, fucking hell, I can't get a break, can't get arrested. Now this fuck is like, oh, I thought, you know. And so when I was, you know, I was doing this heavier, sort of this, um, I wasn't quite that bad, but they were my most inspiring band. And um, and uh, so I wrote in there about uh, Kissy Kiss in the rear view, it was because they were sat in the interview in this cab, but Bo was telling him how great he was. and. I was just jealous, which is a terrible emotion. I'm not even a jealous person, but I just I was just like annoyed. I never expected anyone to hear it because I was so used to making songs that didn't get past the demo stage. Like I could get demos from any label in London, in England, you know, EMI, CBA, Epic, every demo time, and no one would jump and trust me to be. Uh, successful, or, you know, to, if they sign you, they put their necks on the line. Do you know what I mean? Because they can't sign something that doesn't work. So I just couldn't get signed. Just couldn't get signed. And uh, so much like the Pixies sign in England with 4AD being from Boston, we signed with a small label in the Valley. Um, and I did it the other way around. So I based my career, well, not my career, but it was like I was empowered by their journey. And I was thinking, well, if it worked for them, why can't the reverse be true for us? Yeah. And so everyone told me not to do the deal. It's brilliant. The one, the main person who told me was a friend of mine who succumbed to uh, an overdose. And told, the last thing he told me, well, I was, for God's sake, don't sign that deal to America. Oh, he was fucking wrong, wasn't he? <laughs> it's completely wrong. <laughs> it was the best thing I ever did. Um, and plus, uh, I had no alternatives. And uh, nothing beats a choice than having nothing else, no options. Yeah, you know, that's your choice, you know. That's yeah. the epitome of a choice. So, all right. So, so what was that like then? For you know, you you sign with this American label. You know, it's it's against the grain of what's popular in in England at the time because all the bands that you mentioned. I mean, like, I mean, Blur. I would never. It's Britpop, and you know, it's like. So, what is that like to suddenly put out this record and and then for it to just become a smash hit? I mean. Dude, I, it's one of the biggest records of my high school years. I, it's still one of my favorites. I re-listened yeah. to it just prepping for this, and I'm like, God damn, dude, it's fucking perfect. Well, it was weird, you know, after that, um, I went back to work. We, we made the record, and then we lost the distribution deal. So I went back to work. I painted 12 dentist offices right after that. Identical. It was like a Kafka nightmare. And um, big in Magnolia. Uh, uh, down in the West End of London, and um, I didn't really mind. It's because I thought I, I just wanted to make a record, you know. So I was back making fifty bucks a day, but I, I had made a record, and I just felt like that was my voting point. No one had believed in me, and you know, when you're young, that's what I hated about that fucking biopic, that Queen biopic. I just thought it was such nonsense. He's in the front room, Freddie, playing Bohemian Rhapsody, like, and no one's found out how amazing I am. He's playing Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah. It's like, shut up. He like, play something terrible so no one discovers you. Don't play Bohemian Rhapsody like your rap man and off in waiting. Like, I thought it was so like a made for TV movie. It's just annoying because it had no, no reality of being terrible. 
and most of us were just terrible for ages and some would argue we still are but we try our best yeah so so then what was that like for the record to suddenly take off the way that it did when it finally did it was the most beautiful thing i've ever experienced in my life and a sort of uh not a vindication it wasn't like i gave a you know i just it, the best thing is that you know if people don't believe you and people uh when people don't believe in you and people put you down and i've I had a lot of that in my life sort of do you know what i mean John the best thing i can do is just be wildly successful is to make a wildly good song that's the biggest fuck you to anyone you know what i mean because and i've been doing it for years you know we've had like 25 hits on the radio that's a lot that's a lot that's a lot i think i mean that's not something i brag about but thing i think about i go that's pretty funny makes me laugh you know yeah some people only have one hit you know I've written 25, it's kind of, that's all right. There's lots of people with lots more than me, but I'm better than a lot of the naysayers, <laughs> you know? 100%. So it felt beautiful, it felt really good. And it, I was way more depressed um, to be unsuccessful. And I felt really like, uh, it was an affrontery to my own ego of like, God, I can't do better than this continually not getting the breaks, continually hitting a brick wall, doors don't open. I was like, man. So when that happened, I didn't, it wasn't like I became like completely flash and full of myself. I just felt like, finally, I don't have a barrier to get into people. I don't have a barrier. Like if I write a song, people can judge. The first band had a record out and not an album. Um, and I was signed to Epic, like two years into writing songs. So I had a knack for it. And they brought out two singles. And I remember like being at home, like just sitting there with my fingers crossed going, well, it's out. And if people wanted to hear it, they could, you know, no one ever heard it and it sank without a trace. But um, when Bush hit, I just always knew that within reason, if we had something new, people would know about it. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm asking a lot 30 years later, but, uh, um, that's the reality of it that I just felt like well at least now I get you know there's a there's an open window to what we're doing you know so I've re-listened to I, like I said I re-listened to 16 stone and as I was trying to as I'm listening to station to station I'm trying to see if I can find somewhat comparisons between certain songs certain moments uh, tell me if I'm wrong like testosterone were you listening to a lot of bowie when you were writing testosterone it just it has a feel of like a bowie song i i i well the reason i like of that song proud of it is it was a sort of a it was a, a you know clearly um it was you know it was a metrosexual anthem you know what i mean it was a metrosexual anthem and uh very i think the one thing that bowie brought um to us now we take for granted because you know, the world is so fluid. We live in such a fluid world where, mm -hmm. I mean, I have young, I have young kids, you know, um, and it's incredible seeing how um, the lack of homophobia, the kind of, the, the, uh, uh, the acceptance of self-expression, the fluidity of everyone, sexuality. It's like, you know, when we're growing up, you know, you couldn't, you know what I mean? It's like, it's a sort of, I don't know, you couldn't, you just couldn't be as as free. Certainly, where I grew up, I'm sure where you grew up in New York, you know, you get to be like it was just much more homophobic. Of course, and I, and I to me, writing testosterone was a dismantling of that bullshit, you know. Well, and, and that's what I was really proud of because I thought it was a you know, whenever you have a song that, that you you figure and you write, it's good to get ideas off your chest. It's all just ideas you get off your chest, and you kind of like they belong to the world after that. And then to be in a successful band that's like shunning toxic masculinity in 95, you know, that's cool. You know, I'm like, that's that's a decent thing to do. You know, that's the right way to have a progressive society. Yeah. Um, what is that like though? You know, when you're, you, cause you were born in, in 1965 and, and obviously yeah. you said the first record was Ziggy Stardust, which I mean, I, I, I'm born in 79. You know what I mean? Like I, I saw, I had the hair metal, you know, androgyny, but I mean, is David Bowie like really the first 
artist to kind of blend that gap between male and female? And what is that like to when when you're in your teens to see somebody doing that? Well, I think the thing on top of the pops when he was like all the extraordinary outfits, it just was like, I didn't think anything out of it apart from he just seemed like this um, mystical kind of theatrical figure. He's like, you know, he's like Bertolt Brecht. You know, he just combined theater with it. I didn't actually, as a kid, I was too young, too innocent to really take it on a sexuality level. It was only mm. later when he spoke about his, you know, sexuality that that was like, oh, wow, that's interesting. But I didn't even really know what that, that meant. You know what I mean? It's sort of like, it just meant he was dangerous because as I say, where I grew up in, uh, I grew up in North London and um, it was very, very um, homophobic. I mean, extremely homophobic. And so you grew up with that, not even knowing what they really meant. You know, when you're a kid, you don't really know, you don't know about sex. You don't know what they're actually talking about. You just know that, Guys are uh, meant to act a sort of a uh, brutish, thuggish, loud, obnoxious way, and girls are meant to be kind of like laid back and demure and subservient. You know, that's that's how it was. That's the hierarchy that I grew up with. You know, that's how everyone was. And then, as life does, uh, that, that that's been traded off. You know, the last few years, obviously, it's been an incredible uh, revolution for women. You know, long long overdue. You know? So, um, but so if we yeah. just made me think, you know. And he's just, but, but not just about the, the sexuality stuff, because as I say, I was too young for that. It was more the sort of um, all that cut up to all those like disparate ideas. That's how he influenced me the most because I loved Ginsburg growing up. And so lyrically, I'd always get in trouble when I first began, you know, when they wanted to kill me in reviews. If they didn't just hate me straight up, it would be like, the lyrics don't make sense. This and that is like, there's all these pieces. And I was like, I just, you just don't get it. You just don't get it, you know, because I, that's what the Burroughs cut up technique, Bowie used that, there's Ginsburg, all that, that's a, um, what's the um, City Lights store in San Francisco where they published all the beat poets. You know, the beat poets were almost like the precursors. I mean, grunge, it's funny you said the word grunge. Like, but that, that, that sound. thing of disenfranchised, it's the disenfranchised feelings. It's the sort of dis, you know. And so, I don't know. I just always related to that. You know, I grew up in an environment where I had to listen to Bowie in private. Also, I'd get beaten up for like, you know, doing that. Yeah. I get a. I lived in an environment where take carrying a tennis racket to the bus to go play tennis racket at the local club because I fell in love with it on the TV. You get slapped on the way to the bus stop. You know, for like having a sort of a, you know. Uh, uh, an instrument of wealth and um, step below a violin with a tennis racket, like, yeah. you know, idiot. You're like, you know, 16 year old kids, you're like 11 years old, like, just getting slapped on the way to the bus because you love, love tennis, you know. It's kind of funny when I think about it now, but uh, I still love it. It didn't stop me. Who's your favorite tennis player of all time? Uh, Bjorn Borg. Really? You're a Bjork fan. Okay. All right. I'm Boris Becker, dude. Well, just because he was the, that was when I was, <laughs> that was, when I was, a, you know, I was a, sure. a kid and just watched him grow up. And in fact, he uh, he used to practice he practiced at my club. I played at a tennis club called the Cumberland in in England and uh, they had grass courts and one time I saw him warming up and I saw him and I, I saw him in the I saw him in the locker room. He was the first famous person I ever met and um, I just remember being I don't know like I, I don't know what I was how old I was uh, must have been eight or nine nine ten nine or ten and I saw him and I said to him it was the dumbest fan moment because I remember seeing him he's standing there I think he's naked he had a towel and coming out of the shower and it's Bjorn Borg and he's like crazy wide, wide shoulders as a kid I was like oh my god I said to him good luck I know you're gonna win it and as I left I've always been annoyed that I said that like you know, people in armchair have got a feeling about today. It always annoys me when sports fans go, oh, I've got a feeling about this one. I feel good today. It's like, shut up. You're nothing to do with it. You, you know, I'm happy for you, but you're clearly <laughs> nothing to do with it. Right? <laughs> but so I said that to him. I did my worst thing, and I've always regretted it. I've regretted it ever since, because like, it just was like such a like cookie kind of thing to say to him, you know? And I wanted to tell him so much more, but people get tongue-tied. People get tongue-tied when they meet me, you know? And it's very sweet, and 
they, so many times, people, I, I don't want to say, I don't want to say, I, don't. I was like, no, it's fine, it's fine. calm. It's fine. Before Corona, you could just hug someone, you know? Yeah, just no. Just have a contact, just like silence the moment. Now it's like, you put your arm out like that, 10 feet. <laughs> fist bump you, yeah. oh, fist bump you. Yeah. I know you're, I know you're obsessed with my music and I'm the biggest artist of your lifetime, but there you go, just touch my knuckle. Um, well, you got to meet, didn't we? And, and, and Adam, I, I know we, we, let me take this whole thing again. Cut every, cut that stroke out I just had, Peter. Um, you, if I'm not mistaken, you've, I know you've met Bowie. Did you, are you open for him too? Yeah, well, I toured twice with him. Tell us and about became, and that. When I, I became in South America, I, I opened for him uh, in South America on the stadium tour. Uh, two times, um, and um, and then I became friends with them. You know, I mean, I don't know. I, I I can't claim. I don't know the hierarchy of friends. I would imagine. I, I don't know what division I was. I was on the email division. Uh, collaborations was spoken about, and you know, I'd go and see him if I was. Uh, well, I remember going walking from my house in Los Feliz to go see him at the Greek when he played there, and so I hung out with him a few times. Then the last few years. Um, just emails, and in fact, I owed him an email. I have an email from him. I didn't reply to because again, I was getting an email from him. It was a bit of a thrill, you know, chatting about what he's up to, this and that, asking what I'd been doing, and and, uh, and you know, then I had this very deep connection after he passed. Um, well, I met Mike Garson with Bowie a few times because I would go see shows. I was on tour with Mike um, in South America with him, and. Although we were an opening band, you know, sort of would say hello respectfully and whatever. But after he passed, I, I, they had this whole thing where um, a bunch of singers went and played with the original bands. He had a whole entourage group of all the musicians over the years with Bowie. And I played um, I'm Afraid of Americans with that band over two nights at the, I think, the Wilton. Then I did a song with Mike for Music Cares. I did a version of Heroes with him it's on the new record on the kingdom on this bonus track there's a me singing heroes with mike garson playing piano and then and he played the piano on that and we become really 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 close i would say close friends and um nice uh, i'm really grateful for that i love mike and uh, so yeah my my bowie connection is deep and you know i knew iman um I kind of, I feel like I haven't spoken to her in a long time, you know, in the divorce fire. I lost, I, I don't know, I mean, never spoke to her, but um, yeah, Bowie was was amazing, you know, and just so funny and so well read and like just laugh, you know. And, I mean, everything I, everything I know about him is he's like the king of cool. And I mean, my first, yeah. I guess real like taking in a Bowie, I mean, as a kid was, was labyrinth and he was just bigger than life with the hair and the Muppets. And then it's like, you know, and I'm actually, I'll be honest. I'll, I'll say this to you. I'll say this to Adam. I'll say this to all the listeners for until this record, which we're about to talk about station to station. I was, I was a strictly hits Bowie Ziggy Stardust. I had dug into and I had listened to uh, many times, which I loved that record. Uh, but when it came to actually listening to a full Bowie record, it just, I'm not going to say it just never made its way in there. I just never took the time to do it. So station to station, having this come up on the list was the first time I was like, all right, you know, I'm going to sit and listen to this record from start to finish by David Bowie. I don't know anything about it yet. Uh, and I remember when it starts, and I don't know if you've listened to it, Gavin, on headphones, and it probably is the same way on speakers as well. It's just like it fucks with you by going back and forth. There's all those no uh, noises as it drops into the first song. Uh, and I remember I had this moment, which was like, am I about to become a David Bowie fanatic? Is this the moment that changes my life forever? And over the last... You know, I think I've been really digging on this for about two, three weeks since we knew this was coming up. And I mean, I've just gone through almost every record. I've listened to a lot of shit all the way through. Um, this is an interesting album. So I'd love, because I know your favorite Bowie song, if I have it correctly, is uh, The Man Who Sold the World. Am I right? I mean, I don't, to be honest, I don't have any favorites. I mean, it's funny because working with Mike, when he asked me to sing 
recently and I, I wasn't able to do it. I, I was not well. Um, but it's so fun because he's like, you know, pick a song. You know, when you pick a song, you know, pick one of his songs. Uh, ironically, when I was going to do the song with him for Music Cares, which is on this record called Wild as the Wind, it ends with Wild as the Wind, uh, Nina Simone, uh, Nina Simone's, right? And uh, I said, have you ever done Wild as the Wind, like super mellow? When I take people's songs, like I did Mind Games for John Lennon for this tribute record for John Lennon. I like taking classic songs and slowing them down to my sort of funereal, yeah. depressing. I just love that. And this, singing a classic song slowly there's nothing like it i mean cat power has built an entire career off that uh, for sure dude but and but I'm, but gavin but mind games which is arguably one of my favorite john lennon songs if i mean if you take that down i i would love to hear that that's that's a brilliant song i would love to hear it at a different tempo that's fucking powerful you should, you should, uh, on spotify i think it's it's out there no check, I'll check it, out. it out it's pretty i was on radio in australia two days ago triple j and uh the guy goes oh, no, i've been checking this gem and he just played two minutes of mind games on the radio it's really pretty anyhow so i was gonna do wild as the wind and then he sent me because this is the nina simone version that david really liked this is the version that david did live in new york i was like whoa whoa whoa, whoa, whoa. back up back up big guy i think it's been done well have you ever done the heroes slowly i was not gonna touch it after nina simone and bowie i says no, I don't, no, no I, what am i doing now now i'm back to the bullshit kid bullshit kid saying i can do that yeah yeah i think what's so brave about this record not only the beginning um and it's his first sort of the, the, the berlin trilogy right with the pop and uh so it just was so short and different and it was the beginning of this sort of new period for him i mean i find it difficult sometimes to keep up with artists who have lots of records this is his 10th record so i wasn't i wasn't old enough at any point still not old enough, to know there's nine records like, like i wasn't a feverish fanatic but i i loved him through and through so you know i think it's just a uh, it was a, it was the beginning of a whole new era and it was that sort of funky kraut rock thing going on and uh then goes on into what is it was low next maybe low yeah. was the next two records yeah i don't know i'm not a i'm not a bowie expert i just know what i like um but yeah it's a beautiful record you know um i mean what would you like to know what <laughs> what well, no i got it i, I guess like, so, so, so i listen to so, so what sticks out uh, from this record to you? Like, what what are the things that you take away from this? Well, the wild as the wind was just was was beautiful. I had a, um, it was really annoying actually because I had this girl, I had this girl that I was seeing at the time, Sarah Laurie, and I got her madness song. Um, I, it was cute because madness was really big where I was living in North London so madness was really big and we were kids and I got the single must be love I got it from up the road and she gave me wild as the wind but she totally out sophisticated me like a thousand times I was like yeah. ah, god I should have said this so I just love that song and just I'd never heard anything like that. and Bowie did it over and over for me personally where he just opened you up to different possibilities i mean I, of you know like to hear wild as the wind I, there'd never nothing come before that that i could put my finger on to be so vulnerable and um you know there was such a as i was saying before there's such sort of a simple black and white line of like masculine you know guys didn't weren't soft the guys were hard girls were soft and there's no trade-off. That was it. And so for having a song like Wild as the Wind, it just was like a sensitivity. I, I remember being thinking to myself, is he allowed to be that vulnerable? Is he allowed to be that open? You know? Or people are he's not gonna get slapped. He's not gonna get slapped for that, you know. Yeah. Uh, but I love it, it's beautiful. Uh, you know, there's plenty of when I think about it, there's songs that I've written that that's been in the DNA of those songs. Lots of mellow songs I've written. There's one song, Surrender. I don't know what record is on. I think Black, black and White Rainbows. 
I don't know, from that from that approach to music and that sort of that vulnerability, you know, it taught me yeah. vulnerability. Well, I mean, I think you can hear your vulnerability in a song like Glycerin, you know, I mean, yeah. Dude, that, do you understand how many how many yeah. dudes got were able to like hook up with their girlfriend because they learned that on guitar? You're looking at them, me, dude. I fucking those those simple chords. <laughs> you wrote beautiful lyrics. I mean, yeah. you, dude, it's it's fucking brilliant. So I could definitely see some of the influences <laughs> from this record, even in some of your music. I wanted to ask you because this is the main thing that I got. You already mentioned the Berlin stuff that he was doing. So, and you probably do know about this, but for all the listeners out there, during the sessions for Station to Station, Bowie was heavily dependent on drugs, especially cocaine, and recalls almost nothing of the production. He once joked, I know it, I, I know it was recorded in LA because I read it was. He also added, I have serious problems about that year or two. I can't remember how I felt. I have no emotional geography. And uh, because of that addiction, it severed relationships with some of his fellow musician friends like Keith Moon, John Lennon, and Harry Nielsen. Um, so this is a cocaine record. Knowing- It was just weird because I, I think Oasis made the cocaine Yeah, record. yeah, yeah. Well, do, do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? The one with, you know, look out to pay with the gen Those records from the 90s from Oasis, there's enough. Well, he was famous, I mean, no. Noel was famous for always saying, never went like 40 minutes, he never went without having a line of coke. But I think it can sound a bit thin because you keep, you're so jacked, you keep wanting, it's not bright enough, it's too dark, you know. And um, it doesn't sound, I mean, I guess that Harry Meslin, the guy that produced it with him, I guess you could say a boy wasn't sharing his coke with that guy. <laughs> There was someone at the, at the mixing board who wasn't on cocaine. So yeah, not every there, not everybody can get fucked up. Cocaine. It's it's like cocaine. Um, I've heard is like you know you solve the world's problems. You sit with your friends all night. You talk about a bunch of shit. Most people do cocaine and you know get nothing accomplished. He made a fucking brilliant record. And I feel like after me listening to it and finding out about the Coke, I, I kind of think the reason Station to Station is over 10 minutes long, uh, you know, I think 100% the different movements, almost maybe he couldn't decide on one, you know, chord progression. And then he was like, oh, this would be good to change it here. And then, oh, because that's like, you're, you know, when you're doing Coke and you're listening to music, you're like, all right, let's put on this song. Let's put on this song. So definitely Station to Station gives me Coke vibes. I was with this girl the other night and I told her that we're about to do this record together. And she's like, this is my favorite record. She was the one that explained to me before I'd read anything that this was the Coke record. She said this album completely is like doing cocaine, the way it starts, then how it goes into the golden years. Cause the golden years is everything's like, oh, everything's gonna be great, man. This is the best ever. We're having the best time. It can't get better than this. And then he brings it down with word on a wing. And then you've got the beginning of side two with TVC one five and stay. And it's just, and then even in like in stay, he's talking about lyrically uh, struggling with the monotony of drug addiction. And then into, you know, Wild is the Wind, which is a fucking beautiful song. Um, so I think I, I, I don't, you know, know 100% if, if he didn't do cocaine, that if this record would have turned out. But I definitely think that it's like, I think it's pretty, you know, it's pretty spot on to be that big in your career. You doing coke and it's just, you know, no, you have to have the studio do whatever the fuck you want to do. What do you think about the character that he created, the thin white man? Like, what do you? Thin white, thin white yeah. Duke. Um, you know, another one of his characters. I love Ziggy Stardust and I, 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 my best friend in London is a Bowie freak. So he probably knows, he knows a lot more than I do about Bowie, but um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it just was a new character and like it's super stylish and, and different look and a bit more uh, that kind of, I don't know, Anthony Price suits and all the kind of look and the sophistication. It was, it was uh, yeah. 
I mean, so, this was a new character. It's, I like the sound of it, Thin White Duke. You know? Yeah, yeah. So this is one of our Patreon questions uh, from Justin Nemec. So like we said, the, this is the debut of Thin White Duke. What is your favorite of his many personalities or eras? The, so we got the folk singer, Ziggy Stardust, Aladdin Sane, <laughs> the Plastic Soul, Young Americans era, collaborating with Trent Reznor. Uh, which one? Uh, which one is your favorite? I mean, uh, Ziggy Stardust was something extraordinary to me, and they, you know, it has such deep memories for me because it was when I first found out about him, and it was really precious because I loved my aunt so much that for her to give me that um, cultural kind of weapon was just was just amazing and so my love for him is in tandem with my love for her so it's very sure. deep for me so i liked everything he did really there's nothing i even you know maybe labyrinth was my not not my favorite bit the one you got into but um road movie just was so out there so weird um but i really loved that i loved that earthen record um, i thought that drum and bass record was phenomenal that is so brilliant um but basically stuff that he did you know he he just had a way about him and that last you know it's ending on, on, on the black star that last record released on the friday birthday on the weekend died on the monday it's just like that black star song is just unbelievable it was really funny actually <laughs> because when i did when i did the show for the bowie event with his band uh, I chose Young, I'm Afraid of Americans. They gave me a, a range of stuff to choose from. I chose I'm Afraid of Americans, right? And um, it was really good because the band was fucking great. Uh, There's so many versions of it. I had to be super type A and I felt really awkward about it, but I wrote the arrangement out and gave it to each band member because I didn't want to fuck up on the night. I was like in the rehearsal, it was going, everyone's playing different versions. Oh, this is from Stockholm from 1979. This is not the version, no. And so I wrote the arrangement out. So we got it down, we dialed it. And they, it, like, I didn't mean to be drilling them, but they needed someone to be like, no, this is this is the arrangement. And I gave it to everyone. And we had an amazing time. I was so nervous, it was really brilliant. But the best part was poor old Sting, who I love hmm. and admire. But this was brilliant because he played Blackstar with his lute, right? <laughs> now, Bowie doing Black Star, it's just what, 13 minutes song. Bowie doing Black Star, we're all gonna be there like, uh, but, but, but Sting with a loop, you know, he's asking for it, isn't he? He's going out there in a, in a sweater and playing the loop or some shit. <laughs> so the first night, I, when I did the first night, I was so nervous I couldn't even speak. And I rushed left afterwards, just traumatized by the whole event. At home, I was like, why am I home? I wanna be seeing anyone else. So next, and I formed again, when I saw Sting, I said, how'd it go last night? He goes, oh, you know, the critics. <laughs> I was thinking, I was thinking, well, you did come in with a fucking loop. Yeah. The 13 minutes song. <laughs> you're kind of you're looking, cruising for a bruising. <laughs> but hey, things amazing. He gets a hard time, but I think he's he's quite he's quite uh he's 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 great. No, I love Sting. Um all right, let's see if we have any more Patreon questions. Um so Station to Station is produced at a really dark time in Bowie's life. Uh, the darkest, according to him, and he admitted to the the drugs. And years later, said he like like I said before, he didn't uh, he didn't even recall recording the record. What does that say about Bowie that he was still able to produce such an acclaimed album under those conditions? Well, they say the same thing happened to Elton, right? Elton John. He had a whole bunch of like records in the eighties that he can't remember either. Um, I mean, it just means that he that he was surrounded by great people because. He didn't make the record on his own and he didn't press record and he wasn't playing guitar or bass or drums or mixing it. So it's a bit incorrect to think that because he was out of it, so was everyone else. It wasn't like if they'd all been on Coke, that would have been really funny. Then I yeah. think it would have been a record. Do you know what I mean? But I think that there was a, clearly some people that were had their shit together because it's not easy to record that stuff and mix it great and whatever they did. So uh, we see that the boat was incredibly collaborative because he led on. When you got Carlos Alomar, Alomar being a guitar player, you can you can fuck off and do cocaine. You'll be on the track's gonna be fine. 
Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. there's all these people like, oh my God, Bowie wasn't even there. How did it even happen? It's like magic. Not really. It's called other people. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Uh, I'm, bursting, I'm bursting someone's bubble on Patreon. No, no, not at all. All right. We ask these questions to, to all of the guests. Uh, so thank you so much for coming on, buddy. I appreciate it. Um, favorite song on the record? Uh, Wild is the Wind. Okay. Uh, mine, I want to say Station to Station. I really do. I love the four parts. Uh, least favorite song on the record? Um, I'm looking at the looking at the title. I'm um, looking at things. I don't know. My least favorite. I, was, I mean, it's 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 got a few. It's got definitely got a few album tracks on there. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I don't. But I like album tracks. Um, let me see. I want to see which song. Which my least. I mean, it's not, it sounds weird. It's not. No, I, don't, I don't have a least. Nothing annoys me on it. I mean, I like. I, I get like it. Record. Um, you know, yeah, I like, but but nothing. Not you know, TBC one five. It's all right, a little repetitive, but it's all right. I got the idea. How many how many TBC one five have you got? A lot. <laughs> I actually picked. I actually picked. You're gonna hate me. I actually picked. Uh, Wild as the wind. If I had to pick one, I don't know if you should end the record on that. I'm not saying it's a bad song. Like a, this about Iggy Pop's girlfriend thinking it's an alien. <laughs> when all right. Here we go. It's a, it's, yeah, but I, but I, I'm looking at it now. Yeah, but it's just such a. I mean, and that's what's beautiful about music, you know. Yeah. Um, that's what's incredible about music, and uh, I think that, you know, having a Nina Simone song, it's just brilliant. You know, subversive. At that time, imagine at that time. I mean, that's like, do you know what I mean? That's yeah. groundbreaking, and, and at least he was. Um, not appropriating uh, the culture. He was actually just like paying homage to it by yeah. using some of this brilliant. I mean, some of was fierce, fierce. Is a fierce, amazing, terrifying person. Have you seen the, that documentary on her? She's like, she's all power. Love her, love her. All right, what song on this record would you fuck to? Uh. Um, well, you know, it's a 36 minute record, so <laughs> let's hope most of it. Okay, you start right from the jump. Okay, I dig that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I can do 36, I can no definitely, guarantee. Yeah, no guarantee. No. But, you know, nah. but, Older we get, man, the time you know, gets less and less. Yeah, yeah, this, 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 this undressing, this getting dressed. Uh, and then, and then the last question: Do you think, out of all of Bowie's records, and wait, what other albums, Adam, are on the 500 Greatest Albums list? Okay, so the other Bowie albums that are on this list, uh, he'll come up four more times. A lot insane came in at number 279. Low was ranked at 251. Hunky Dory at 108, and The Rise of Fall of Ziggy Stardust and The Spider from Mars at number 35. Do you, so this means this is our first David Bowie record on the list. It's the lowest ranked out of all of them. Do you think out of those other four that got mentioned, uh, this is ranked accordingly between those? I know Dizzy Stardust is your jam, so that's the lowest and also probably the most, his biggest and most important. But do you think that this one is in the right ranking in those, uh, in the Rolling Stone list? Uh, fuck Rolling Stone, who knows? <laughs> Thank you. What are they? You know, what do they know? Hundred percent, hundred percent. Proud sponsor of <laughs> Five Hundred Rolling Stone. Now, this was this was great, man. Uh, I, I can't thank you enough for coming on, brother. Um, once again, do you have anything you want to just promote away again? Anything you want us to check out, or, or, or it's your time. Go ahead. I'm just, I um, you know, we we you know, no, I mean, Spotify or whatever platform you use, um, make it easy to check out whatever we've been doing, and we have a new record. I think. It, Apropos of this whole conversation, Mike Garson uh, songs I did and play playing with him on the bonus of a kingdom should be checked out. If anyone cares about, you know, would care to hear me stealing uh, time with Mike Garson. And it's fun for me because of all that piano stuff to, for him to play on it. it just I made me weep when I heard when I heard what he'd done. It made me weep. I love it. We'll make sure we check that out, dude. Thank you so much for coming on, brother. All right, thank you so much, all the best.